good. Let me see if you can hear me. That should work. So, yeah, that's better. Good afternoon and welcome to our midweek service here at St. George and Tron. Great that you came here, great that you are here. And also welcome to all of you in the, in the cafe. Please simply continue to, to enjoy the food and maybe you want to listen in. That is what we do here once a week on Wednesdays. We have a midweek service and we simply want to show that this is a church. We are a life church and we worship God. My name is Thorsten König, and I'm not the minister here. Our minister, Alistair Duncan, has a few days off. I'm training to become a minister in the Church of Scotland, and I'm my second year now, and I'm really delighted to lead us in worship. You may remember, two weeks ago, roughly, we celebrated Easter, and in the tradition of the church, we are still in the Easter season, so to speak. And this is a time when we think about and we want to reflect what happened after Easter and Pentecost is to come and some of you may know that is the big celebration when we celebrate that the Holy Spirit came to the disciples but there is a time in between and consciousness we want to look at that so for today I have chosen for reading the, dis the next day the disciples directly after uh, Jesus' death, what happened? And we will hear more about that. But for the beginning, let us pray. We are here, O oh God, gathering as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are here, O oh God, to see you, the creator of the world, the loving one, the one who revealed himself in Jesus. We are here to worship Jesus as the one who died and rose again so that we can come in your presence. Bless us now, O oh God, when we listen to you. Amen. Our first three verses, you see it on the sheet, we will sing, well, one of my famous, Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. So the first two verses. And please stand for that. Please sit down. Let us pray. Loving God, in this Easter season, we are reminded of how difficult it was for the disciples to grasp that Jesus was not dead, but alive. Living Jesus, you came to your disciples when they needed you. We pray that you also come to us now and reassure us. Help us in our moments of doubt that we reach out to you. Help us to be honest to ourselves as we wrestle with our uncertainties. Let us experience that you love us because we struggle and not because we deserve it. Comfort in spirit, ever present in our lives, surround us with your presence. Make your presence known to us. Reassure us that our questions are valid and not something for which we need to be ashamed. Holy Trinity, Forgive us whenever our doubts take over. Forgive us for harsh words that ignored your love. Forgive us the things we left undone. Assure us of your never-ending love and grace. Give us your peace. Through your love and forgiveness, Holy Father, we are now bold to join into the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our story today is from the Gospel of John. And let me just recall what happened just the day before. After Jesus died on the cross, he was buried. And the next moment, the next uh, morning, the disciples and Mary Magdalene came to Jesus' tomb and they found it empty. The disciples, the disciples turned around, went away and hid themselves in a locked room. And that is where our story starts in chapter 20 of John's Gospel. When the evening when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said that, he showed them his hands and his sight. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said that, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his sight, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Also the doors were shut. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Thanks be to God for his living word. Amen. Some would say our story today is an ancient story, but I don't think so. I think it's everything but an ancient story. It's a story which fits into our time today pretty easily because it's about the questions, what can I believe? What is real? Who can we trust? Is faith in Jesus something that fits into our modern world? Well, I told you my name is Thorsten, but for the moment you could even t call me Thomas or Peter or John. Just pick any name of the disciples. Because I have all sympathy and understanding for the attitude, for the re reaction that they were hiding. Let us recall what just happened 24 hours ago. Jesus died on the cross. He was put in the grave which Joseph of Arimathea provided. The grave was closed with a big stone. The Romans even sent soldiers to guard the grave to ensure that no one could tamper with it and even more importantly that nobody could steal the body. And now, the next morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to Jesus' tomb to wash and anoint his body, how it was custom in ancient times. And she found the tomb open. Despite the heavy stone, despite the guards, and those guards had disappeared. So she ran back to catch Peter and another disciple. They all arrived at the tomb only to find it empty. No body and they could not make any sense out of it. So the disciples returned and locked themselves away somewhere in Jerusalem in a safe room. 
they were afraid. They thought they need to protect themselves. Jesus is dead and his body is gone. What is now left from the time when the disciples were together with Jesus? When they traveled with Jesus all around the villages, when they listened to him, when they saw his great deeds, his miraculous wonders. Now, all seems to be past. All is gone. This is the first time that they were alone after all these years without Jesus. And they may have wondered, does this really make sense? What is real now? Who or what can we trust? And for me, this sounds very familiar. Well, I've told it so often, but for those, I'm originally trained as an analytical chemist. And one of the foundations of science is an experiment. Only what can be proven by means of an experiment is real. And this also only when other scientists can ex repeat your experiment and came to come to the same result. And that is called evidence-based science. And only what is evidence-based is real. This is the principle of science. And maybe the principle of our time today. Because often we hear, you can tell me a lot but I only believe what I have seen myself. And more, should this world not be ruled by rationalism and common sense, evident-based, and then we will be all right and everything will be better. But I wonder, is this true? Are we really so rational, so self-confident, so smart, so capable, can we discern what is really, what is real and what is not real, what is fiction or what is, and now we have this modern word, fake news? Take all the conspiration, the, uh, conspiration theories, which became very famous and we can't escape them. There are stories that the coronavirus virus is not real. It, that all was invented by some secret powerful people to control us and to rule the world. Or take how the Russian media report about the war in Ukraine and Russia. That the Russian army had to go into Ukraine to protect the people, to bring down a Nazi regime and to liberate the poor suffering Ukrainians. We are surrounded by fake news. We are flooded by news and stories. So how can we decide what is true and what is fake news? Who or what can we believe? What is real? So no wonder that the most common reaction on the stories about Jesus today is hesitation and doubt. The stories about Jesus are so ancient, are so strange, and maybe okay, some of us may even say, or some may say, the story may have some moral or ethical value, but to take them for real, especially Jesus' resurrection, oh, give me a break. How can a modern rational person believe in this? And some may say, wait a moment, Thorsten, sorry, Thomas, Peter, or John, wait a moment, Thorsten, you are right, this is the spirit of a secular world, but we as Christians, we know better. And let me challenge this. Why do we label each other as liberal or as orthodox, as conservative, why do we have all these discussions in our church, especially in the Church of Scotland, how to counter the decline of church membership and of faith? For me, it seems there is not a big difference between the secular world and a Christian world. We all struggle to discern what is real, what is true, and what is the right thing to do. And here, we are back in the room where the disciples locked themselves away. 
Jesus' body is gone. And the next thing we read is Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said that, he showed them his hands and his sides. The disciples, when they locked themselves away, they did not expect anything, especially not that Jesus was appearing among them. We do not read that there were big discussions or that there were big disputes. We just read Jesus came to them, spoke with them, and showed himself to them. And that was not a dream, not a ghost, not a vision. It was reality. The real Jesus, as they know him, he is among them. And the disciples will read, rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They see and they hear the Jesus. He is alive. He is risen. And they, tell, they, they are so enthusiastic, they want to tell Thomas about it. Thomas, the one who missed out. But for Thomas, only being told about it is not enough. Even being told about it by his best friends, with those he was traveling for three years, this is not enough. Thomas was together all these years with Jesus. Thomas has seen the miraculous things Jesus did. But believing that Jesus is alive, that was too much for Thomas. Thomas only wanted to believe what he can see and touch. And here we are again. At least for me, this is something which is very real. Because sometimes I'm almost like one of the disciples. I'm eager to tell others about my face. And when they are nice people, and most of them are, they say, you know what, Torsten, you are a nice guy, and when your face is good for you, there's nothing wrong with it. But we are realists, so everybody should believe what he wants. And when they are less friendly, well, I have also some of those, they roll their eyes. One even told me that I better stay away with my unrealistic and even fanatic conviction. And maybe you have expected something similar. And maybe like me, you feel helpless and frustrated in such situations. And then we are in good company with the disciples. They were also overwhelmed by joy when they met the living Jesus. They wanted to share this joy with Thomas. We have seen the Lord. Jesus is alive. And all what they got back from Thomas was, unless I've seen myself, I will not believe. Quite a cold shower. And sometimes I'm Thomas. I've heard so much from others about their faith, the great experience they made, they made when they have prayed for something. Or when I attended a great Christian gathering with all the fellowship and all the singing, I'm encouraged, I'm faithful, I feel so good. And then the next Monday, reality hits me again. And here, we are again in the middle of our story. Our story is humbling, but our story is also encouraging. And most importantly, it's realistic. The disciples and Thomas, they struggle too. They hid in a locked room. They could not make sense out of what happened. The more they did not understand why Jesus died and why his body was gone. How does it fit in their lives? How does it fit into the world? in our world? How can we understand the complexity of our world? How can we understand God's world, which is beyond what we can see and touch? Our story tells us that it was Jesus who came to the disciples. Jesus came to them even when the doors were locked. In Jesus, God revealed to the disciples that God's world is present, 
present among them because Jesus is alive. But you may ask, how can we believe this today? How can we experience this today? Can we see Jesus? Can we touch Jesus ourselves? Well, that is why we are together now here. We gather to hear stories about Jesus. We gather because God has called us to listen to him. And we will experience that some of the stories, some of the prayer we'll do, will touch us, will help our faith. Sometimes we may wonder if God is there and this is all real. And this is okay, because that is the same like the disciples. But Jesus has promised to be there and Jesus came. And there is a second thing. Like the disciples, billions of believers before us, like us, were called to share the gospel and our stories. Not only today in here, me preaching, but to our friends and to our neighbors. And we will experience that some will listen to us and some will roll eyes, and that is okay. Also, the disciples struggled to convince Thomas. But our message today here is that the full reality of the God is beyond our comprehension, but it is real. The reality of our story today is that it is God who will reveal himself in Jesus. The reality of our story today is that Jesus is alive and that he wants and will meet us. The reality of our story today is that Jesus will use us to spread the good news and the gospel where he wants to lead us. Amen. Let us pray. Risen Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are not only a story, but the living Lord. The living Lord who is eager to reveal himself, who is eager to meet each of us with love and compassion. And Lord, also we cannot touch you as Thomas did. We thank you that we can reach out to you in prayer. Also, we cannot put our fingers in your sight. We thank you that we can proclaim you as the Lord and the God of this world. Also, we cannot see your body among us. We thank you that you open our eyes, our hearts to receive your peace. And we praise your wonderful name. Living Lord Jesus, we live in a world where many are doubting also they are longing for truth. We pray for those who doubt because no one has ever shown them your love. We pray for those who doubt because they have been hurt or let down by others or have never learned to trust. We pray for those who doubt because of natural war, of natural disasters and war, who have lost loved ones. And we pray for those who doubt because they are in dark corners of themselves, who grieve or who are sick. Lord of life, Lord of love, we pray for all who doubt for your, who long for your love, shine your resurrection light into their lives. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Let us sing now the last two verses. And I really like that. When we continue now our journey through this week, wherever we go from here, remember, what Jesus has said on the first day of his resurrection. Peace be with you. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank you all for being here and I wish you a wonderful 
and blessed day.